Hi everyone. I decided, hopefully by the help of God's Spirit, that um, I'll do this one more. <laughs> and given time in the future, if it turns out that Yeshua does not come as a thief in the night um, on Lamb Selection Day, I'll at least keep you posted on the on the appointed times as they arrive using God's calendar. So, uh, before I forget this, make sure that you're aware, to, like today is the 16th of March. So the 18th, which is a Monday, is our next Sabbath day, the one God said to keep, not the Christians or the Jews or the all the other religions of the world, <clears throat> all the different things they say. God's told us he wants us to keep his Sabbath holy, keep it holy. It's, it, he made it holy, and we're to keep it holy. And um, God is not that God who tells us that any day will do. <clears throat> he gives us his appointed times, and then he has given us his calendar, which he gave probably, I'm, I'm proposing he gave us the book of Enoch very first before any other book was written. But the Jews and Christians, Christians and Jews have removed the book of Enoch and the book of Jubilees from the what we call our record of God's word. Many people call it the Bible, but God does not. He calls it uh, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. And my speculation is that in the final analysis, where when we're in God's kingdom, we will still just have those three sections of scripture of uh, God's word called the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. But all these books will fit in there. The, the um, Book of Jubilees is already called by its own when you read it, you'll see this. It's called the second book of the Torah. So it'll be put right after Moses. And then the book of Enoch would fit amongst the prophets. Probably be the very first one. When the prophets are all lined up in order. And then the, the apostolic writings, what Christians call the New Testament, they will be put into the category of the writings. And then the book of Revelation stands alone. It will be put uh, very last in the prophets, but not because it's least important, but because it's the capstone of all the prophets. It's what ties all the pro prophetic messages together. And it's written in a mystery form. And now God in these very late hours of this world before uh, before the tribulation ramps up in, in, in great intensity, and then God's kingdom begin, begins. All these things are going to happen, and the appointed times explain the, pl the whole plan of God with all of its details. And as I've uh, tried to make this very strong point many times, we cannot understand God's plan if we don't observe the appointed times. There's 10 of them. And in the keeping of those 10, we're actually keeping an 11th one. We're celebrating the, new, the uh, Great Tribulation, a 50-year Jubilee time cycle. So back to what I was saying, you... We will not understand that plan of God if we don't keep those days. And now we have the calendar of God re restored to us in the book of Enoch. So now we can use that calendar to find the right days. And here we have two Sabbaths right ahead of us before Lamb Selection Day. And what God is saying through his prophets, his prophets, his true prophets, he's saying at the appointed time, I'm going to act. He's going to come and find his bride. 
He says he's coming as a thief in the night. So uh, we have two Sabbath days right ahead of us, the 18th, Monday the 18th, and I'm speaking from the point of view of Saskatchewan, so there will be a, a uh, uh, international date line somewhere, and I've explained to you how you find that, but, uh, um, well, then the next Sabbath is the 25th, the Monday after. Uh, this one, the first one on the 18th, we'll see the half moon in the sky, so that's what you want to do. Uh, you ask God to give you a clear sky, and you, on um, Sunday evening at sunset, that's when God's days begin, on the 17th at sunset, you watch for that half. And it, it wants to be exactly due south here in the northern hemisphere and due north in the, in the southern hemisphere. That was a bit weird being in Argentina, seeing the sun and the moon in the north instead of the south. Uh, it was a bit of a challenge to find it because we lived uh, in a concrete jungle. You could see a strip of blue sky if you look straight up from your balcony and lean out and look up. Fortunately, we had a nice big park about four blocks away, right beside the very famous cemetery in Buenos Aires, uh, where Avita, a very famous champion of, of the orphans and the widows and the um, the children and the mothers, the, the downtrodden. Uh, she, this, the whole, um, the whole story, we'll call it, testimony of Avita's life was that my wife was powerfully drawn to that whole thing, and she uh, is right now in the process of figuring out what. Does God want me to do with that? What, what's he saying to me concerning this uh, important political figure, we'll call her. Her husband stepped aside so she would have a voice in Argentina in the uh, 1950s, we'll say. I think, I think she died in 53. Anyway, I could have some of that a little off, but she, she died very young. But she did probably more than any other political f figure in Argentina, and perhaps uh, you know, in a worldwide setting too. She did as much or more than anyone else, other than Yeshua. Okay, uh, that was a bit of a rabbit trail, but um, you look at the moon; it should be a half in the sky. Depending where you are in the world, it might be a bit short, might be a bit over. So uh, you determine from what you see if if uh, Monday is Sabbath for you or if uh, the moon will tell you. Anyway, and then and go back and uh, uh, episode 1551, I had a visual, and you might find that helpful, a visual of the the 28 days that the moon shows its face to us. And then it gives us a sign on the seventh day, the 14th day, the 21st day, and then the sign actually for the, the 28th day is, is difficult to see, but uh, the moon disappears is basically what happens. Uh, anyway, once you establish your first Sabbath, you just keep it on that same day of the week, four times and then you know there's going to be a moon, new moon festival and then your sabbath will change either one day or two days and the moon tells you all of those things and don't worry about getting it wrong <laughs> i said this a number of times but god restored this very recently he's been patiently waiting for people to do it right for uh, many, many centuries. So when we start trying to do it right and we make a snake, it's going to bless them. <laughs> no matter uh, how, how, we, how well we do or, or just don't worry about that. Just start, start your learning curve. I've given you a few heads up. Uh, so then we'll have another Sabbath 
uh, on the 25th, same thing, look for the sun. That'll be the full moon one, so that that's more elaborate, there's more signs. You can read uh, Enoch, get a hold of a copy of Enoch, or pull it off the, pull it off of the internet and listen to it. You know, I, I don't have, there's lots of people have lots of computer skills, so it's, if you can't do it yourself, go find somebody who you think is a good uh, computer nerd and get them to help you or her. In my case, it was, it was my wife. <laughs> she, she's helped me through all. I'm a, I'm a low-tech computer guy. So uh, the reason I point out those two Sabbaths is because I have pointed you towards Lamb Selection Day as a the possible uh, appointed time the Lord will return as a thief in the night to find his bride. It makes, it is logical that he would come on the same day that he, the groom, was chosen. And then I have a second choice uh, in my, this is my logic and my thinking, and I've hopefully been equipped with quite a bit of knowledge to pass along to you. My second pick then is the first day of the Feast of First Fruits. And again, I've explained this many times. Christians are completely, like overall, completely unequipped with this knowledge. It's all there in your in your scriptures, and the, it's very obvious the new, so-called New Testament church that Yeshua trained and was the pastor of. They were keeping these appointed times. It's very obvious, and uh, what you'll experience right ahead of us. We'll have Lamb Selection Day on the. 10th day of the first month. Uh, I should back up a little bit. The first day of the month will be the 21st. Uh, and, you know, do all your research. Go back. Please go back uh, all nine episodes. Yeah, start with uh, 327 Go all the way to 355, and then uh, I'm also going to encourage you to watch episode 307. Uh, hopefully, with those 10 episodes, then you have a a good overview of all that God is asking us to do. The Christian Church and the Jewish Church are not teaching truth. They they teach a tiny bit of truth and they mix in a, a huge quantity of error and misinformation. And as I explained in my last video, you pretty much have to leave the established church, go into the wilderness and be, be asking God where you go, what you do, how you do it. And I've given you all these um, heads up so you have some tools to go by. Start by prayer and fasting and uh, and if, if indeed Yeshua shows up as a thief in the night on the evening at midnight on the 29th uh, so the the feast the lamb selection day begins at sunset on the 29th carries through to sunset on the 30th so if he comes as a thief in the night, and, it, and if it turns out it's very literal, midnight means in the middle of the night. And that time of year, uh, the, the night lasts from about 6 o'clock to 6 o'clock, almost everywhere in the world. That's very close to the equinox. So midnight, in fact, would be 12 o'clock at night. On, on in the Babylonian system. So I have uh, suggested that we drink, drink a little bit of extra coffee that evening and stay up. And uh, in fact, if, if Yahushua is being very literal, we, we want to be awake when he comes as a thief in the night. So anyway, that's uh, my, hopefully my uh, 
best encouragement to prepare yourself the best you can if this is all new information don't let that worry you the the thing God is looking for is a is a teachable heart uh, just to have everything perfect is not we will never have everything perfect in a lifetime we will get better and better at not sinning but if you're starting right now, just starting to understand what's right, what's wrong, you know, the misinformation from the Christian church and the Jewish church, God knows all that stuff. And uh, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the theology of liberalism and legalism. God, our God is not a legalist, nor is he a liberalist. He's, you know, if we, if we want to uh, talk about these concepts, he's right in the middle of the road. He wants us right in the middle of the road. He's the only one can look into a person's heart and know exactly what all is in that heart of ours. He's looking for... Uh, our God says he's drawn to those who are humble, who are broken, who are uh, the fatherless, the widows. He's drawn to those who are kind, gentle, and tremble at his word. He's drawn to those people that tremble at his word. And by that, it's not like a uh, scared to death fear. It's, it's a heart that wants to obey their father. Uh, I thought of this. Um, analogy when I was a kid growing up and you can put yourself you know if you grew up in a at least a reasonably functional family you know that was reasonably normal where you had a mom and a dad some sisters maybe and a, some brothers or I had no brothers I had four sisters anyway uh, my my father was quite stern so he was you know, if I was to compare him to our Father in Heaven, our Father in Heaven isn't. He's very approachable. But he is stern in the aspect that when he asks us to do something, he wants us to do it. And he's looking for those people who obey him. So, back to this analogy. When I was a kid, I was given the task uh, of looking after all the cattle when I, when I turned eight. And... Uh, I, the, the first job every morning and every evening was to milk the cow. So this, this is the analogy I developed. I said, okay, Neil, my dad would say, Neil, uh, go out, get to the pasture, get the cow, the milk cow, bring it in, feed it a little bit of, of uh, chopped grain, chopped oats, a little bit of hay uh, to keep it preoccupied while you milk it and then once you finish milking it let it back out to the pasture and this is summertime uh, scenario because in the winter you had a barn to clean out and it was you know our Saskatchewan winters we get we do get down to 40 below and 50 in a wind chill that's you know doesn't happen every day but that's our winter they're cold there's lots of snow generally anyway back to my dad telling me the scenario things to do and then when you're done bring the milk into the house and run it through a filter and put it in the fridge and then my mother would have this fresh milk in the over a short period of time say overnight the cream would rise to the top she skim it off and use it some to make butter some to uh, you know, put in your coffee, whatever uh, moms use to do their baking with uh, cream, and this is generally very rich cream. And then make sure you leave a little bit in the milk so it tastes good. <laughs> you know, so you, it's sort of like whole milk. Uh, anyway, I have this long list of things my father asked me to do. And it pleased him, it pleased my father when I followed his instructions. Got all these things done. And 
know, I carried on through my young life till I was 18 doing these chores. Uh, get up early in the morning, do the chores in the morning, before school, and then uh, after I got home from school, go out and do the chores again. And in the winter, it was a lot harder because I had the barn to clean out, uh, you know, day by day and then on the weekend. Anyway, I'm making too long a story here that our father is exactly the same way. He's asked us to do a whole bunch of things. They're his instructions to us. He says he's never changed, ever. The instructions that he gave through Moses in the Torah, that is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, are exactly the same instructions and teachings and commandments that are referred to in the book of Revelation when God says, refers to those who have the testimony of Yeshua, Jesus, and they keep the commandments of God. Those are the same exact commandments. And Christianity through Satan, the angel of light, has spent 1,700 years trying to convince the people, the believers, that Jesus got rid of that law that Torah. Jesus' response to that is Matthew 5, 17 to 19. Do not think I came to abolish the Torah of Moses. Do not break the least, even the least commandment. Do not even break the least commandment. Do not break the greatest commandment and do not break any of the ones in between. There, I have elaborated on what he said. So you read it for yourself. And then he said that those who break any of those commandments from least to greatest and teach others to break those commandments will be considered the very least in the kingdom of God. And he did not uh, say that we would be in the kingdom of God if we did those two very bad things, broke, broke them and taught others to. So, as you can well imagine, that eliminates virtually 90, we'll call it 99% of the teachers and the preachers and the prophets and the, the whole works. But there are quite a number of people who have read their scriptures for themselves and they realize that those teachings are incorrect. Anyway, uh, the point I was making, of course, is our Father has asked us to do certain things. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So now I've, that's a really big one. Uh, I've talked about lots of other big ones, you know. <laughs> keep, remember the, the uh, orphans, the fatherless, those without fathers, and though, like young people that have no fathers, remember them, remember the widows, um, be, you know, work on becoming a kind, generous, uh, compassionate, patient person. There's a whole bunch of things that he asks us to do. And one of them is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So now I've showed you how to find the Sabbath day. I've showed you how to find the first appointed yearly appointed time of our spring season, which is the Lamb Selection Day. And then shortly after that, we'll have the Passover followed. Der and remember, the, the uh, few things our Lord added to our understanding of, of how to keep the Passover uh, and that you wash one another's feet when you get together and that you uh, you take the bread and the wine to uh, to commemorate and to represent his broken body and his shed blood. Remember all those things. That's part of Passover. And then directly after that are the seven days of unleavened bread. The first day is a Sabbath type day. You don't work on that first uh, day of unleavened bread. And you take that. One of the do things you do on that first day is you Go, go through the house and find all the leavened bread that is left, you know, because 
you would be planning ahead for it, so you'd be not making any new leavened bread and using up all the old stuff. Take whatever's left, and this is a type of a ceremony as you read it, because the Lord commands us on that first day, which is a Sabbath day, gather up any leftover leavened bread, take it out of the house, and um, some don't even throw it away, they just take it out of the house. <laughs> but I said, just throw it in the burn barrel and burn it, or take it to the dump, or you know, whatever, get rid of it. And it's a symbol of get, getting rid of sin. And then for seven days, which is a, a number pointing towards completeness, you eat nothing, only unleavened bread. If you can't find some, the, the Jewish people call it matzahs. If you can't find any of those, just make some. Some flour, a bit of water, and a bit of salt, and uh, flatten it out. The flatter the better, and cook it in the oven till it's kind of a hard cracker. Cut it ahead of time, it might be, or break it apart when it's done. Anyway, eat unleavened bread for seven days. Now, that, that is a picture of the immediate challenge we have after we accept the blood of Yeshua to cover all of our past sins. Immediately we go into the days of unleavened bread because it pictures our lifetime of removing sin from our life. And as a human, we will sin. God knows that. But he knows that we will get better and better at not sinning the more we practice not sinning. So that's our challenge, our lifelong challenge. So those, uh, and then what we do, the next thing we do as far as the appointed times is we identify the first Sabbath, weekly Sabbath, that occurs after the Passover. And in the case of this year, I should have kept my calendar out. Make sure I explain this properly. So this year, the days of unleavened bread, which follow directly after the Passover, will be from the 4th of April until the 10th is the last day of unleavened bread. In the process of doing that, the first Sabbath day, which the moon tells you, that occurs after Passover, so our Sabbath will be on Monday at that time. The third one will be the first, third Sabbath of the moon cycle, and then the last one will be on the 8th, and I'm speaking from my perspective here in, in southern Saskatchewan. You watch the moon. The very next uh, day is the feast of first fruits, according to now. I, <laughs> if you read all of the scriptures concerning this, so the, the very next day after that Sabbath day is the ninth, but the ninth is also the new, a new moon, and we're going to have a two day new moon the ninth and the tenth. So, in fact. I have said the 11th. It actually, following all the scriptures, the Feast of First Fruits is the 9th, but you don't start counting the weeks until the 11th because New Moon is not part of a week. Which I've, I think I've explained quite effectively through this series of 10 episodes. So if this is all new to you, please watch all 10 of them. Please. And equip yourself. This is this really is life and death. If the intense part of the tribulation by many, many, many servants of God, he's warning us is about to begin. Like right away. And he's also adding this thing about the appointed time. So I'm teaching you about the appointed times. So uh you examine these scriptures. I'm going to say the Feast of First Fruits. I've said it was the 11th, but it's actually the 9th. But it's also the first day of a two day new moon, and it's not part of a week. So you start counting the weeks on the 11th. That's the first uh, work day. And then you count out 
the seven weeks as the moon tells you, and you will end up completing a count of seven sevens on the 30th of May. That's the, the final, the seventh Sabbath. And then as the Lord tells us, the very next day is the Feast of Weeks. And that's what they were doing in the book of Acts, chapter 2. They were counting out these seven weeks so they would have the correct day for the Feast of Weeks. They did not call it Pentecost. That was slipped in there by Constantine's dream team when they translated the original Aramaic and Hebrew. Uh, that's what the apostles would have used to write their letters. Uh, Aramaic was the common language of the day. Greek was almost unknown at that time. So there was no point in writing anything in Greek. And, and Paul was likely the only apostle that knew Greek. But why would he write in Greek? Because nobody would understand his letter. So anyway, uh, that was uh, slipped in there by our angel of light, along with Christmas, Easter, and Sunday worship, and Halloween, and Lent, and Advent, and all uh, Strove Tuesday. I finally figured out what that was. Ash Wednesday. All this stuff and uh, the worship of Mary, we, we could make a long, long list. And, and I'm not picking on Catholics. Just remember, we're all Catholics. We've kept, all the churches have kept most of these tr traditions in the Christian arena. And then in the Jewish arena, they have uh, believed the rabbis who say they have the right to add to the Torah. But God says, do not add to my Torah and do not subtract from my Torah. So that's a message for all of us. Let's do our best to be obedient. And that's back to what God is not. <laughs> sorry, I started this. God is not a legalist. He's just a loving father like mine was. Put yourself in. If you had a loving father and uh, he was teaching you as a child growing up in your home, teaching you some very basic things in a functional family. Uh, that's what's expected by the Father, that you would obey his instructions. So that's our Father. He's asking us to obey him. He's uh, not demanding that we do, but he's looking for the few people who will choose to be obedient. That's what he's looking for. He is not a legalist. And he is not a liberalist, you know, to carry on with this theological argument. Right in the middle of the road. He, he's the only one can search our hearts. So, uh, yes, you want to tremble at his word. That's one of the things God's looking for. And that would mean that when he says, I would like you to keep my Sabbath holy, then you do it. And now I'm telling you, and you can... You can check this stuff all out. Do your own research. Okay, I think I got that covered well enough. Hopefully you can uh, get out of the ruts of Christian paradigms that uh, I have called it in the last number of episodes, Christian rhetoric. We hear something over and over and over and over, and then it comes out of our mouth. Not because it's truth, but because it's a paradigm. So to say, oh, you're, Neil, you're teaching uh, salvation by works. No, I've said as many, many times as I can. No, God is, has always told us we can only be saved by the blood of the Lamb. Because we're dead in the waters. We needed that problem of our sin looked after because it earned us death. So now it's looked after, but the next step is to keep the days of unleavened bread. That is, work your entire life at uh, searching out and destroying that sin thing. <laughs> Look into your life. What sins are you involved in? Have you been? 
and start removing that, like work hard at it. That's, that's your number one job for the rest of your life is to be aware of sin, remove it from your life, and keep it at bay, keep it out of your life. Okay, um, I wanted to give one more heads up as far as the instructions of the of God's revelation is that this year is the Sabbath year, and that this is me talking. I have explained all this many times that I I feel I have I feel I have the evidence to show that this. Ju final jubilee of time started on October 2nd, 2017, which is the first and last day of every year. And that's the day that this final jubilee of time started. So now we're, we entered the seventh year last October. The seventh year is the year you rest your land. And this is one of the things that God said about the, the Great Tribulation. He said that when the Great Tribulation comes, the land will enjoy its Sabbaths, the ones you never gave it. And that was the scripture that uh, convinced me as a farmer some, well, just about 50 years ago, I began studying the Word of God and I saw that fairly early on and I became convinced that I needed, I was a farmer, I needed to rest the land on the seventh year. I didn't know which year was the Sabbath year, but I, I knew by the time I had farmed seven years that it was one of those years. So on the seventh year, I rested it. And then again, seven years later, I rested it. But, and then in the course of time, I found the Book of Jubilees. I was, well, my, our, our God, restored it to us. Now it's available to everybody. And there's a promise in the Book of Jubilees that if you will keep the land Sabbath, God would reveal to you when, when the, the um, Jubilee is, because that's the key. The Jubilee tells us how to order out these seven rests, and then after you've done seven sevens, just like our count to the Feast of Weeks, once you've done your seven sevens and years, that 50th year is the Jubilee year. So uh, I've gone through this, that um, God follows his own rules. So he restored all of Jerusalem, the last remaining parts. He restored to their rightful owner, the Jewish people, uh, during the Six-Day War. And I'm going to say it's June 7th that that, you can find the exact date. I, just, I watched a documentary on the Six Day War just very recently. And uh, anyway, I, it was during those six days that I think it was the sixth or seventh, they fought a, a, a terrible battle on Ammunition Hill. They, all the commanders were killed, but the soldiers kept on fighting and they won the battle. And then uh, they hadn't planned to do this. They invited the Jordanians who were, their army was occupying these last few areas of Jerusalem, the Temple Mount and City of David and the wall, the, the famous Wailing Wall. Uh, um, they invited the Jordanians to live after, leave. <laughs> and they packed up their tanks and their soldiers and their guns and left peacefully and that wasn't on the radar so but it was on God's radar so anyway that city of Jerusalem was completely restored to its rightful owner and that's one of the rules God says we're to follow that we return all land to its rightful owner on the jubilee year so that makes 2017 the next jubilee year and like from 2016, 2017, and then the beginning of the final Jubilee started on that Day of Atonement, October 2nd, 2017. We're now at year six and a half, and this is the land rest year, 
that's just a heads up. And if you're a gardener, to make your plans ahead. And if Yeshua comes as a thief in the night, um, that'll adjust all our plans right there. And be ready for the intensity of the great tribulation to ramp up directly ahead of us. I would remind you again, keep track of God's Healer 7's messages. She, Barbara just had a warning for us to give our children a heads up, to be ready to, to look after their food needs themselves by learning how to live without electricity and water supply and the whole nine yards. Get back to how we did it even 50, 60 years ago before we had all these modern conveniences. So equip our children. And then Julie just had a message today that was given to her on uh, the 11th of March. So read it. Uh, many, many, I'm uh, going to call many, many true prophets are warning us that time is up and God is about to shake the earth. And I expect it to be literally a mighty earthquake, but it'll also shake us up in every other way. We'll lose all our modern uh, conveniences and uh, it would would be best that we it would be best if we had been planning for this for a long time which I I have been I was given a dream I'm gonna say this could have been 45 years or even more ago uh, about the uh, time of trouble and that it appeared to me in the dream that our farm was a place of safety. So that's part of the journey that God's going to take his fleeing people through. He's going to rescue a third. You'll read that in Julie's uh, message. Re always read the scriptures. And uh, he's going to take a third. The other two thirds die because they're not ready. So that would be a heads up. Try to make adjustments in your life to assure that you're one of the third that God will take through the fire and you will be amongst the first fruits, most likely the last category because the first category is the bride, 144,000. God, uh, Yeshua, Yahushua is coming as a thief in the night to find his bride very, very soon. And then the second group of first fruits, the guests, the we used to call them bridesmaids, the attendants. They will be identified very soon after the bride, maybe within a year, let's say. I don't know. Julie has given a, a lot of details of this, so go back and read them. And then this uh, vast group, the guests to the wedding, the third category, they will take the full jubilee cycle, what's remaining of it, to be refined in the refiner's fire. I just thought of a, another possible part of this scenario that I've, I've said that God's going to take the tenth out. You read about that in Ezekiel 20, uh, this final ex, great exodus that takes 40 years. But it starts from day 1335, so the places of safety are part of it. God will uh, protect these people, and then he'll gather them all into one spot on the shores of South Africa. And uh, what was the point I was making that, okay, then they spend the 40 years going through the wilderness and the Lord says in Ezekiel 20, he says, those who refuse to obey me, that is the Torah, will never enter my, mind, uh, my land. And I have said, they just die like the others did. You know, in the first Exodus, they die in the wilderness. And their bodies are strewn along the whole trail for 40, well, whatever it is at that point, 35 years. Take a guess. And, uh, but there is the possibility that they just have to stay at the River Jordan and wait <laughs> and enter the kingdom as human beings rather than transfor transform into, no, that's not the right word, changed changed into eternal spirit beings uh, in what 
Christians call the rapture. So what we're talking about is not the rapture. It's a transformation, and Julius explained all these things. Anyway, I'm going to call this my last best effort to awaken anyone that will choose to become awakened. And uh, if I'm saying anything that you're unaware of, then go back and watch these 10 episodes. See you. Be blessed.